old days, they raced on the streets around Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. And then they built the magnificent Road America Circuit. And that's where we are today as the fight continues in the Indy cars. Hello and welcome. I'm Paul Page. This is a, a gigantic circuit. Four miles around. Fuel is absolutely critical here. And it's a natural terrain road course. Now, there have been two other natural terrain circuits raced thus far this season. Portland and Mid-Ohio. Let's take a look at this. At both races, Rick Mears finished sixth. At both races, Bobby Ray Hall third, Emerson Fittipaldi second, and you guessed it, Michael Andretti was the winner in both natural terrain circuits thus far this season. So, Derek, I think that may predict what we might see here today. Well, as you've seen by the graphic, Michael really has been laying down this strong challenge to Bobby Ray Hall, who has not been able to respond until he got here and took his first pole position of the year. And then there's the fact that Allinger Jr., his teammate, will start alongside. Now, we wonder, will that help Ray Hall? Well, in the short term, it will, because it pushes Michael to the second row of the grid. But in the race, or the fight for the championship, it will not help him, because Al Jr. can still win this championship, so it's every man for himself in the race. Then we mentioned the fact that fuel is critical here, so they use telemetry. Let's go down to the Andretti pit right now, and Gary Gerald. Well, Paul, unlike years past, real-time telemetry now available to the Newman Haas team to monitor very closely the fuel consumption for both Michael and Mario Andretti. Fuel, as you mentioned, is so very, very critical. It has played into the ultimate outcome here in years past on numerous occasions. It's interesting to note also, Michael starting inside second row today. This is only the second time in the last six races that he hasn't been on the pole position. And the challenger, Bobby Rahal, is now right in front of him. So as this field warms up, they come down the long front straightaway and get the green diving into that hard right hand first turn it should be very very interesting to say the least now for more on that telemetry situation let's go further up pit road to Jan Bikas well Gary the telemetry is used normally or mostly for tuning the engines for the proper fuel economy now of course that was pioneered here in the Penske organization but this morning, in the Sunday morning warm-up session, when they used the telemetry most often to set those settings, it was raining and they couldn't get the figures that they wanted. Now is when the telemetry is really going to come into play, because as the cars scream by here on the front straightaway, they'll get the information on the computers. They will then radio back to the drivers and tell them either leaner or richer on the engines to get the fuel economy they wanted. It's very important, because in practice, they only got 1.4 miles per gallon. You must get 1.8 to make the distance. So there will definitely be some fuel conservation in the opening laps here. Jan and Gary will be covering from the pits. The cars have already started and have begun the parade laps as we count down to the start of the race at Road America. Today's coverage of the Texaco Haviland 200 on ESPN is brought to you by Toyota Motorsports, where technology on a fast track is built into every Toyota. By Quaker State, the big Q is one tough motor oil. And by Goodyear, the unanimous choice of every single team that races in the Cars IndyCar Series. The field now beginning to work around as the pace picks up on the pace lap at Road America. Let's take a look at the starting grid. Brought to you by the diehard battery now with more power when you need it most. On the pole is Bobby Rahal, twice a runner up here, but still looking for his first win. And Al Unser Jr. starts outside. The second here in 1983 when he was a rookie in the series. The second row, Michael Andretti, the defending champion of this, the Texaco Haviland 200. And Scott Pruitt, whose strong efforts recently have netted three straight top five finishes. The third row, Emerson Fittipaldi, who won this race in 1986 and 88. And Mario Andretti, the only three-time winner of this most prestigious event. In the fourth row is John Andretti, who made his IndyCar debut here four years ago. And Rick Mears, who has finished third here in three of the last five years. The fifth row, Ari Leyendyke, who has six top ten finishes in seven starts on this four-mile circuit. And Eddie Cheever, who ran ninth a year ago in his only Road America start. In the sixth row is Danny Sullivan, who won here on the final lap in 1989. And Scott Goodyear, a young Canadian with a brilliant future. In the seventh row, Mike Groff, driving for A.J. Foyt. And Jeff Andretti, the leading candidate for Rookie of the Year honors. So we take a look down through the entire rest of this starting field. Willie T. Ribs back in the car. Everybody is happy about that. Scott Brayton had a terrible accident here on Friday, but is back in the car sore, but is ready to go racing. And in the final row, John Jones will start all alone with Buick power. Now the track here is really gigantic, Derek. 
one of the finest road racing layouts in North America. Four miles, 14 turns, predominantly right-handers. Extremely fast, 190 miles an hour plus during practice. Station five here is the slowest corner on the racetrack at 55 miles an hour in second gear. Then we go through the carousel, then the long back stretch down to Canada Corner. One of the key overtaking maneuver areas here, taken at 80 miles an hour. Then we go to turn 14, the last overtaking opportunity. They approach it at 155 miles an hour. It's a fourth gear corner. They go through it at 95 miles an hour. With a lot of elevation changes, a most interesting circuit here. Now, the weather has been very pretty, but right now it's overcast, and there is about a 40% chance of rain. Hopefully, that rain will be after the race itself, and at least is what the aviation forecast is saying. In the chase here for the points, going back to the Meadowlands and bringing it through last week at Meadow Ohio, look at that right column. Those are the points being made up by Michael Andretti on Bobby Ray Hall as finally he overtook and then last week surpassed Bobby Ray Hall in the points fight. And don't forget, Al Unser Jr. is still very definitely in the fight as well. Any one of those three, Ray Hall, Michael Andretti, Al Unser Jr., could score the win of the championship. This season is most definitely not over yet, and there are, in fact, only three races to go. The onboard cameras, Michael Andretti, who will start in the second row. And looking out the back of the pole sitter's car, Bobby Rahal, as he looks back to Michael Andretti behind him, and then over and alongside, starting on the outside of the front row, Al Unser Jr. with his over-the-shoulder view. Johnny Rutherford brings the pace car down to speed, and the field goes over to the control of the pole sitter, Bobby Rahal. You look back from Rahal's car as the acceleration up the hill begins. They were warned, start this race nice and even, and the green flag comes out as they get a good start, flying down the hill toward the first turn as Allinger Jr. moves in front of his teammate. But look at Michael Andretti move up into second place. Michael Andretti drops into second as they go through the first turn. A tremendous start by Allinger Jr. But further back, Mario Andretti went from the outside of the track right across the bows of everybody to the inside and picked up a nice fifth place. A most interesting section of the circuit here at Road America because see this little woods that lies just ahead? Well, it's nice and calm. Wind can't get down in there, and it is somewhat breezy here today. Now down to that Station 5 that Derek Daly mentioned for you. And Al Enter Jr. continues his lead. Everyone else has lined up behind little Al, and I'm sure, Derek, everybody's going to be very careful about fuel. Well, that's right. I'm sure what Bobby Rahal is thinking about now is the pole man usually sets the pace, but Al Jr. was actually a full car length, all one of the Hemelgarn cars. Right, this is Buddy Lazier in deep trouble very, er very early. This is exiting turn five. But Ray Hall, we mentioned earlier, I'm sure he's thinking that Al Jr. did have a full car length before they ever got to the starter stand. Al Unser Jr. leads them down into the carousel now. A fast, fast sweeper. And as a matter of fact, they say that now they can pretty well keep their foot on the throttle all the way through here. This is the look back from Bobby Rahal's car of the start. Take a look at Michael as Michael was looking everywhere he could to find room and finally got past Rahal. The reason he had room to go down that outside of Bobby Rahal was Al Jr. was already two or three car lengths ahead of him, so left enough room for Michael to make that maneuver. Allinger Jr. calculating the start well. Now coming toward the conclusion of lap number one underneath the bridge, making the turn down through 13 and through turn number 14. Now they climb a hill. One of the nice things here is elevation changes. And as he climbs the hill, this is the first time ever that Al Unser Jr. has led the opening lap on a natural terrain circuit. Michael Andretti second. Bobby Rahal comes across the line in third. Then Scott Pruitt, Mario Andretti. Eddie Cheever is in sixth. Ari Leyendijk is seventh. Emerson Fittipaldi is eighth. Then John Andretti, then Rick Mears rounds out the top ten. Look at Scott Pruitt running very, very strongly. Oh, Didier Thays, more smoke coming from that car. He had major engine problems during practice and qualifying here, so another short day for Didier Thays. Another significant problem for him. That's two cars that have pulled to the edge of the course here in the first four miles of the race. First we saw Lazier, now we see Didier. Something is well fried in under that engine bay because you see the smoke coming from the, uh, the bodywork as well as inside the engine. When it's cool like this, and it, and it is a bit cool here today, you can see the yellow flags being displayed in this section because they're going to try to give uh, Lazier a toe in and get him off the course. The question, let's just talk about this, Derek. The question will be full course yellows. Now, there's a lot of room here. The drivers would really love to see a couple four course, full course yellows to help the fuel problem. 
The problem with full course yellows here is this racetrack is four miles long. Now, Buddy Lazier is at station five. He's only about a mile into the racetrack. It will be almost impossible to tow him, and of course, way too dangerous to tow him all the way around the full lap. So hopefully, we'll see him just take him off the racetrack if he doesn't get that engine fired up on the first pull. One of the advantages now, here, here's something we have a little radar watching back into the kink. Look at the speed as they come through there. There goes Fittipaldi on through. 169 miles an hour we saw through there. Remember, that is a flat in fifth gear right-hand kink. Probably one of the most dangerous, one of the most demanding corners on the racetrack. And Michael Andretti closes up behind Al Unser Jr. Ray Hall is right there as well as they climb the hill on the pit straight once again, accelerating to their top speed near 190 miles an hour. They stretch out, but it's a sharp right-hander that lies just ahead. Up at maximum revs now, Al Unser Jr. begins to slam it down through the gears. And Michael Andretti begins to close on little Al. Ray Hall closes in as well. Strategy is to finish ahead of Ray Hall. He does like to win the race. He has never been one to sit back, but his most important strategy is to finish ahead of Ray Hall. In reality, though, very few of them can run any kind of a conservative strategy now because the points are so very, very close. Well, Michael Andretti runs in second. Ray Hall's back in third. The race is underway on what should be a fascinating afternoon at Road America. Jr. is still in front at Road America, but Michael Andretti is right behind him, as is Bobby Rahal. The first three have begun to pull a little bit away from the rest of the field. Now, I'm sure, Derek, that they're all watching how they drive because fuel economy is going to be critical here. There you see Scott Pruitt coming through, followed by Mario Andretti, and then just behind them is Eddie Cheever as Mario tries to dart out and find a little racing room heading down to Station 5. Eddie Cheever was able to get around Ari Leyendijk in that first lap. And he has been steadily moving up. He's moved up from uh, ninth to sixth position. Steadily moving up. And he got himself in a bit of a controversial uh, situation with John Andretti. And again, here with Mario Andretti. They had some words after qualifying in practice yesterday because uh, Cheever, he's driving very hard. He is very aggressive. You know, and some people don't like that. But however, that's what he's trying to do to get the job done. Just behind him, an absolute master on this circuit, Mario Andretti. He's won three races here in the Indy cars and have just years of experience in all forms of race cars on this circuit. To give you an idea of the speeds here, this is this kink, this dangerous, very fast, flattened fifth gear kink. Look at that speed trap again, above 166 miles an hour they come through here. The carousel, the one you saw before, that they actually go through at 140 miles an hour, so extremely fast here. We've done a couple special things for you here at Road America. One is the placement of those radar guns. Now, they're not necessarily placed at what would be calculated as the maximum speed in any one straightaway, but they're certainly there to give you a representative speed about where they are placed. Allinger Jr. still holding off Michael Andretti as they splash across the line. And along this straight here, the fastest speed all weekend was by Bobby Rahal. This is a, the end of the pit straight. He did 193 miles an hour during the first day of qualifying. I think that's probably as fast as an IndyCar has ever gone around here at Elkhart Lake. All right, Scott Pruitt continues his run in fourth place. Let's get an update on that effort. Here's Gary Gerald. Scott Pruitt reporting a bit of a push as far as handling on the race car is concerned, Paul. So they will go to the first stop, which they target right around lap to 15 or 16, and then make a wing adjustment, hoping to improve the handling characteristics. They want to build on that terrific fourth place run a week ago at Mid-Ohio. Occupies fourth, but he's got Mario Andretti right on his tail at the moment. Separated just a bit from that three-car battle at the front of the field. Scott Pruitt looking forward next year to Chevrolet Power in this chassis that everyone seems to think is handling very well and just needs a little more oomph in the power plant. This is a very good car. This is a very good, well-managed team. Now, when they get the Chevrolet engine, they will have to build a totally new car because the Chevrolet engine is actually a little bit longer than the Judd engine that they use. So a totally new car, updated aerodynamically also for Scott Pruitt next year or for True Sports. The because battle for sixth place, Cheever, Lion Dyke, and John Andretti as they come out of the carousel through the gravel pit. They name corners here. I love it when they do that. 
Well, uh, that's a very much a European uh, system also. All the corners are named over there rather than numbered. So now, in fact, down here we call it turn 12, Canada corner. Look at John Andretti. What a battle they had at mid-Ohio last week. Ended up actually touching each other. Andretti went off the road. Was very, very um, loud in his criticism of Cheever after that race. So I think... You know, he really, he wants to show his boss here. Yeah, but this morning on the grid, they broke the tension a little bit because it was quite tense after mid-Ohio. Uh, the team for John Andretti had a had a hatchet-like affair on the back of the car and labeled it a uh, Cheever Cleaver. So it gave everybody a good laugh as they uh, were ready to roll away. Now they just race, and they race very closely as John Andretti closes up behind Eddie Cheever in the ongoing fight for this position for seventh place. Continues. Let's go to the pits once again. Here's John Vickas. Well, Paul, when you and Derek were talking about the fight between Bobby Rahel and also Michael Andretti, we often talk about the crew and the wives especially, how their emotions, how that image, what happens inside the driver's helmet. When he came by for the first time and Michael had gotten past him, they all just hung their heads. Of course, the race isn't over, but it just shows the emotion. They know they have to beat Michael. Let's go down now to Gary Gerald. Ted Prappas is out of his car. They came in dead stick. They tried to test fire the engine. They believe it's a motor problem that has sidelined him a very short day for Prappas. We just saw Randy Lewis fly by in pit road. Michael Greenfield has also made an early stop in the pits. So a lot of activity early for some of those that were trying to move up from deep in the field. And really some surprising activity. You can add Didier Tay's name and uh, Buddy Lazier's name to that list. And now John Jones, the Buick powered car. John Jones, the slowest qualifier here. Really, that's to be expected because remember, he still uses the stock block Buick engine in this car, which is the only Buick engine here, and in stock condition with the the, uh, the, the pop-off valve they're allowed to use, that engine does just not generate the type of horsepower to get down these long straights fast enough. Young man from Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. I went up to him at the end of the session yesterday, and he, he was so frustrated with it. And I said, well, John, you know, you're, you're running against an entirely different engine here, and don't be too frustrated. These are, after all, very long straightaways. On board, the Quaker State on board camera, Michael Andretti, as he continues his pursuit of Al Unser Jr. See how he closes up under braking, but remember, Al Jr. is on the power maybe half a second before Michael because he's tr still trying to get to the apex, and he draws out the five or six car lengths again. So the chase continues at the front of the field and the ongoing battle for the PPG Cup. You like brats, hamburgers? Boy, Road America is without question the place to hit the concession stand. Seven laps are now complete of the scheduled 50 lap or 200 mile distance here in Road America. Al Unser Jr. jumped on the green flag, moved to the front. He's now being chased by Michael Andretti and Bobby Rahal and Scott Pruitt with Mario Andretti right behind and a little battle of their own going. At the same time, Ari Leyendijk has managed to move up into sixth place behind Mario and Eddie Cheever is still fighting it out with John Andretti. Speaking of John Andretti, we noticed a little vapor at the back of the car. Jan Bikas is down in their pits now, Jan. Well, they just got word, Paul. They got word from CART that there was some smoke coming from the back. They had a quick huddle. We also talked about telemetry and how it's mostly used for fuel economy. But what they can also do is they can take a look at oil pressure, oil temperature. Right now, they think there's no problem. In fact, he just turned his fastest lap that he's run so far. They're just hoping it's just a little extra oil that's burning itself off. John Andretti then with a sterling effort. Let's hope he can continue that run. Remember, he won the very first race of the season. And no, he cannot. He's slowing on the circuit. John Andretti, and there you see a little bit more of that vapor. Very definitely on reduced power, if not totally shut off. An absolutely decisive pass he made on Eddie Cheever and how short a time he lasted in that position. Now, we do hear, still hear the engine running. Yes, it's still running. Any transmission? Maybe he doesn't have any gears. Well, if the uh, if the wisp of vapor we saw is actually at the back of the gearbox, that could very well be it. And the gearbox isn't something that you normally see monitored on telemetry, is it? No, that's right. Sometimes they monitor just the oil temperature in there, but that looks like certainly a gearbox or a transmission problem, not engine for John Andretti. 
So John Andretti by the side of the race course is Alinzer Jr. and Michael Foy. Look at how much of the track they use all the way off the left edge as they come through those corners there. They're using every foot of this magnificent circuit at Road America. Michael, well, if he can win today, he'll set a new record in the IndyCars with the most wins at seven in a given season. But right now, foiling that attempt seems to be Alinzer Jr. And through this king, they did 171 miles an hour on the last lap. We don't get a good clear reading on this lap because the cars are actually too close together. But these cars are actually getting faster because the fuel load is getting lighter as they burn those gallons of fuel away. Again through Canada Carter, back up the hill. There's John Andretti's disabled car. And a little bit of counter steering there. There's uh, Scott Goodyear as he works around this circuit. Michael Greenfield just being passed there, having hit, uh, one of his very few rides this year. But Michael Greenfield qualified quite well here, uh, driving one of Dale Coyne's cars. This is the carousel corner here. Remember, 140 miles an hour is the slowest speed these cars go through that turn. As you see, Scott Goodyear now pulled in on another one of the back markers, Jeff Wood. And you can see the, scar the kart safety team, the white flag, tells the competitors not that there is one lap to go. Of course not. On a road course, what it says is there is a slower moving vehicle ahead of you. In this case, it would be the actual kart vehicle itself. Scott Goodyear now running in 10th place and a standing yellow being displayed in that section of the course because of the disabled car of John Andretti. The Quaker stayed on board camera. Michael Andretti in second place. This entire year, Michael Andretti's been the chaser, but now he's the one being sought after. We ask him if this has a change on him mentally. It's always nice to be the one that's putting chase, I think. And, you know, we've been uh, trying, following our way to get to this point, and now that we're here, now we have to keep it. And, uh, you know, the way to do that is just try to finish ahead of Bobby in the, rest of the next three races and, and the championship will be ours. So uh, it's not going to be easy. We're, we're not in a must-win situation unless Bobby puts us in that situation. And, uh, as well as he's been running, you know, it looks like it's going to be that way. Well, Michael Andretti at the moment is where he wants to be, one position ahead of Bobby Rahal, but he's chasing Rahal's teammate. You mentioned they use all the racetrack here. We're back with Emerson Fittipaldi having a battle of his own with Danny Sullivan. The Penske car is not running too well here because Mears and Fittipaldi are currently shown in eighth and ninth position. So Fittipaldi runs in ninth. Let's get an update on the Penske pits and the Fittipaldi situation. Here's Gary Gerald. Paul, well, we were questioning whether or not it was just a conservative approach here because of the fuel. Well, there's a boost problem for Emerson Fittipaldi. He's down about an inch on boost. And, of course, with the high-speed straightaways in this track, that could be critical for Emerson. As far as Rick Mears is concerned, they wanted seven or eight laps to get those tires up to temperature and let him settle in, see how things sort out. They say they're happy with Rick, but a boost problem for Emmo. Emerson Fittipaldi closing in on Eddie Cheever now. This is, in fact, a battle for position if Fittipaldi can get up the hill and catch him there. But this is the point on the circuit where that one inch of boost would make a world of difference. Oh, they can quite clearly tell you. Look at Mears. Had a little look and a peek down the inside of Cheever, but wasn't quite, quite close enough. Yes, an inch of boost, some people will tell you, will be half a second a lap here. Half a second a lap is a huge amount of time. Mears right behind Cheever, then Fittipaldi a bit back there. And, and you could see just on that climb up the front stretch the difference that it made for Mears and the difference that it made for Fittipaldi. Danny Sullivan, Alpha Power, sits at the back of this group. Eddie Cheever, number eight in front. Look at Rick Mears as he jumps on the brakes going down into Station 5. And Mears picks up the place. Mears moves into seventh. Whoa, Mears came from a long, long way back under heavy braking into turn five. Like that because he wasn't really that close to Cheever, but he really stood on those brakes from a long, long way behind. And luckily, Cheever knew he was there, or else we could have had a little another bumping match with Cheever. Now, Emerson Fittipaldi has Eddie Cheever to deal with at the front of the field. It is still Alonzo Jr. leading with Michael Andretti second. John Andretti has finally been towed back into the pit, so his crew will go to work on that car. At Road America, 10 laps, one fifth of the distance is complete.
Pacific Road America, the Texaco Haviland 200 for the Indy cars. There's the leader of the race, number one, Allinger Jr. Right behind him is Michael Andretti, the current points leader in this year's points chase. His nearest competitor is just behind him, but he's fallen back just a bit, and that's Bobby Rahal. Right now, Michael is doing everything he can. Look at how far back Rahal is. Michael's doing everything he can to stay with Al Unser Jr. You begin almost to wonder, Derek Daly, if you don't have a little bit of a rabbit situation here where the Gallus Preco team is flinging Al Unser Jr. out there and forcing Michael Andretti to chase him. I don't think we have a rabbit situation here because I don't think in a situation like this, these are sprint races. You cannot really let somebody get away. And remember, Alan Sir Jr., if he wins this race, can put himself in a very strong championship position. So Rejo needs to go faster, not uh, pull out a strategy map. Twelve laps are complete. And speaking of tactics and strategy here, how one approaches the stop for fuel, and most specifically when they do it, is absolutely critical. Let's go down to the pits and start with Gary Gerald. Oh, we're at pit entrance, and we just saw a pit sign for Mario Andretti indicating three laps. We imagine that he'll be in on lap number 15. Interesting about pit placement, though. If you look back down on the entry in pit road, you see the orange cones down here. Officials have put a chicane in to slow the cars down on pit entry. You're coming up a hill. You have the chicane. You slow it down. Those that are positioned at this end, including Michael and Mario Andretti and the Penske team, would seemingly have somewhat of an advantage because if you have to slow for the chicane, then speed up and go on down the line, that complicates things. And down at the other end of the pit are Ray Hall and Unser and Jan Beacon. Thank you, Gary. Being down here on the other end, once they leave you at the beginning of the pit, you can get up to three or four gears. You might even get the fourth or fifth gear by the time you get to these pits. Now, normally, the morning, Sunday morning practice session is when the drivers come flying into the pit lane for the first time because, remember, all the other practice sessions, there's a speed limit in the pit lane. So, in other words, they've never tried it at full speed. So, both Allinger Jr. and Bobby Rahal behind me will come in at maybe 150 miles an hour and have never tried it at that speed, bringing it in. And, of course, the timing is critical. I tell you what, I wouldn't want to be heavily invested in those uh, pylon cones that are making that chicane if the two leaders come whooping in side by side. The most difficult thing for the driver is when they put something new there on the morning of the race. It is extremely difficult to pick out exactly where the apex is because, remember, all those orange cones look exactly the same. I've seen cars hit them before when they just get introduced on race morning. A gray, overcast day here at Road America. It was a magnificent day yesterday. Temperatures into the high 70s. Temperatures are in the 60s right now, and there is a 40% threat of rain in the forecast, so they've indicated that that rain would probably come after the conclusion of the run here at Road America. We take a look down through the entire field, actually, positions as of three laps ago continue to watch the lead and again Derek they're using every inch of the circuit oh this is such a hard fight here look at both drivers drop those wheels off exit in the corners now look at the white line they paint down each side under braking look Al Jr. right over the white line now we'll go across now he'll probably go over the line look right over the line there's a little rumble strip there then there's gravel he doesn't want to get, get onto the gravel but those white lines they're supposed to be the racetrack but it's not wide enough so they use even more than they're supposed to use. The circuit has a great deal of character as to a, a lot of elevation changes. This, for example, is an area that is only seen by television and the corner workers called Thunder Valley through the kink, slamming the gears down. Tremendous elevation changes. This is Hiro Matsushita, the Panasonic car, now about to be left. Now, Al Jr., remember, he's got to get by him very quickly because Michael will pounce at the first sign of half a door being left open. Let's ride the Quaker State onboard camera with Al Unser Jr. and watch. Michael Andretti now is closed back in on Al 
Spencer Jr., both of them well aware that their crews are anticipating a pit stop any time now. And Al Unser Jr. did got do something. It already in. Already in. The first one to make a pit stop. That suggests that maybe he is not getting the type of fuel economy that he needs or certainly not as good as the Chevrolet. Ten seconds in and out for Scott Pruitt. We saw as he passed the still disabled John Andretti car. I'd like to know, though, I saw Al Unser Jr. make some sort of a motion across the front of his helmet. Now, I thought he might have been trying to te take off a tear-off, but it looked as if, in fact, his visor was actually giving us some trouble. I noticed he was doing that climbing the hill before. It's like he has his back, the back of his hand. Is he maybe just trying to wipe it clear? Is maybe there a little moisture in the air that we can't see what's affecting him? And also, remember, he actually got up behind two cars. We have a great shot from inside Al Jr.'s car. In fact, I would suggest he did take a tear off off because the one he has on now is totally clear. Perhaps he got some oil or fluid from Mat Matsushita's car when he followed him to try and put the lap on. 14 laps are complete. Pit stops are due any time now. Nothing has changed at the front of the field. Alan Sir Jr., then Michael Andretti, then Bobby Rayall, Mario, and Scott Pruitt. Jr. screams to his pit. We have a very special microphone right there, as well as Jan Bikas. Alan Jr. brings it to a stop. They get the tires off. We're expecting no changes here. Here comes Bobby Rahal right next to him. This should be very interesting. Let's listen to two teams going to work at once. along with his teammate Bobby Rahal completing their stop on lap number 15. Michael Andretti elected to stay out and will go another lap, another four miles, and in doing so, picks up the lead of the race. Uh, things happen so fast during these pit stops. But now, the thing we're going to watch now is can Michael get into the pits and get stopped faster than Al Jr.? Remember, he cannot pass him on the racetrack. The next opportunity is for his team to help him make the pass. So Michael Andretti picks up the lead of the race. He flashes around Tony Bettenhausen down through Thunder Valley. And you can see the little contrails created by the vortices off the back of the wing in this heavy, humid air here at Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. Through Canada Corner, up under the bridge. And already he'll begin thinking about moving over to the right and up onto the pit lane through that chicane and into his pit. We watch for him. His crew is standing by and waiting. Here he comes. And he climbs the hill now. Gary Gerald is right there. Paul, we watch and we wait with the crew. Now we see him through that chicane, comes flying in, has to hit the brakes hard. Now slides in, almost got one of his crew in, but he did get it to a stop. Boy, that was a close call. We watched them go to work. Tremendous amount of brake dust coming out of all of the wheels as they change the rubber. Fueling hoses intact, still on jacks. This is taking longer than they'd want. seconds. I don't think he's going to be able to get that lead. Not for what happened here in the pits. Meanwhile, Mario is in. Mario is going to change the wicker bill. They're taking it out off the rear wing. Michael had no adjustments. Mears goes by us. He locks up the wheels. Mario roars out. Wow. Pit action at Elkhart. This is amazing. The first stop's being completed now. And Derek, it looked like Michael may have pulled it off. I Rick think, Mears makes his stop. I think he pulled it off. I think he did. We got a glimpse of Al Jr. going by, but well behind Mears is in, Fittipaldi is in, a long stop for Michael Andretti. And they seem, you saw Richard Buck of Rick Mears' team clapping as they came through. His, here is Eddie Cheever, Chip Ganassi's car as he makes what seems to be a little more leisurely stop. He clears the visor, stutters with the gearbox as he comes out. Now they have to push the car to try and get Eddie Cheever going. And it is an uphill push because this pit lane does have an uphill slide. They're not even going to try it. They're going to take it back and start it. What a disaster. After all the work you put on the racetrack, and it all goes to naught when you come into the pits. The harem scarum time. Michael Andretti. 
makes his first stop, as does Al Unser Jr., as does Bobby Rahal. On a critical situation at this race course, because it is so long, if you don't hit it right, then you're in big trouble. And for Michael, it was one lap further, it seemed to work out. And a longer pit stop than he wanted, but somehow he did get away with it. Let's go down to Eddie Cheever's pit. Jan Mikas? Well, Paul, we saw him have to yank him back and restart him. Remember in mid-Ohio when they had a longer than expected stop? And then Cheever just burned out of the pits and then went and just drove like crazy? Exact same thing here. But remember, this time he was the one who killed it leaving. It wasn't the crew's fault, so he's still hot under the collar, but for a different reason. You know, one thing, Derek, we sit at home and say, oh, wow, how did he do that? You know, it's getting these cars rolling is not as easy as it seems. You have a stick shift car at home, you put it into gear, you let the clutch off a long, long, long way. It takes a long time to engage that clutch. In a racing car, you stick it in gear, there's maybe a quarter of an inch from the dead stop position to fully engaged. You have to have enough revs or you'll kill the engine instantly. That's what happened. Well, Michael Andretti flashes across the line almost three seconds ahead of Al Unser Jr. This was during the pit stop as he's saying to the guys, come on, let's go, let's get out of here. And his crew kept him in the lead. Rick Mears works his way past safety two with Ari Leyendijk right behind him. And it is a battle for sixth place between Rick and Ari. Working his way past safety two, the worst possible time to catch a safety truck when they're right on the apex. That means you have to go wide onto the dirty part of the road. Luckily, Leyendijk wasn't too close behind because he couldn't take advantage of that. In fact, I think Leyendijk also had to go on the outside wider line. Ari Leyendijk driving for Vince Granatelli as they try to work their way around and continue keeping station behind one another. Here comes Michael Andretti over the crest at 173 miles an hour measured there. He'll go up almost 20 miles an hour faster before he starts breaking down into this corner. That's right. Remember, he's now got his 40 gallons of fuel back on board again, so accelerating that massive weight is what slows these cars down. So we'll look for that speed shot later, and it will go up well into the 180s. For Michael Andretti, the crew did what he couldn't on the race course as they got him back in the lead. Elkhart Lake is always the toughest race on this circuit in terms of fuel consumption because of its length and the changes in elevation. Danny Sullivan tells what can be done for potential problems in this week's tip from the cockpit. Every time that you come by in the pits, oh, in the modern day of computers as we know with the generators going and everything, um, you have what they call telemetry, and every time you cross the start-finish line, that telemetry reads off exactly the fuel consumption that you used on that particular lap. And those guys are always coming on the radio headset going, slow down, slow down, slow down. you got to save more fuel, because the window, the where we can really stop here, is really only on a particular lap, whereas in most tracks you go, you might stop, say, between lap 26 and 28. But here, because the window is so small, and again, the distance of the track, your window is that particular lap that you're on. The big thing you do in the Indy cars is you short shift. And what that means is, let's say, when you're qualifying and the engine's set up to rev to about, the red line is about 12,000 or 12,200, what you'll do is short shift. You'll only go to, say, 10,500, 11,000 RPM maximum. And if you're out cruising, you're in front, let's say you've got a big lead, you might even drop that to 10,000 RPM. The fuel here is the, the whole game. It's just a matter of how much you've got at the end of, end of the race. And uh, if you've saved a little bit because you've been conservative during the course of the race, and you've got a little bit more, as uh, we proved in 1989, uh, you, you've got a little bit where you can run hard for, say, the last two laps, and you can run flat out. You've got a great chance to win the race or, or pick up a couple of spots. First, Danny Sullivan, very definitely a man who knows. Mario Andretti, three-time winner here, as he tries to hold off a charging Bobby Rahal. Rahal fell back during those stops. He's back in fifth place now, trying to catch the fourth place Mario. Rick Mears, we think, had a very good stop because he was trying to catch Leyendijk out on the racetrack, and we see him actually ahead of Leyendijk here. So we think that mainly happened through the help of his crew in pit lane. 
but this is a nice little fight that is renewed once again. You see just a glimpse of Tony Bettenhausen back behind him. He is not running in position behind them, but Rick Mears with Ari Leyendijk right there as they come down toward Station 5. Let's get an update on the fuel situations. Here's John Vegas. Well, Paul, you were talking about, and especially Danny Sullivan was talking about that short window, that small fuel window, where, in fact, we wondered whether when Bobby Rahal and also Alan Sir Jr. came in at the same time, were they running short on fuel? No, they're not. They just decided to take that window just a little bit earlier. But we wondered. We saw both Al Jr. and Bobby Rahal make pretty quick stops, but yet Michael took a position on the track. I think it goes back to what Gary and I were talking about earlier, that position in the pits. In other words, they make quick stops as far as the crews, but going in and out makes a big difference. And now let's go down to the other end and Gary Gerald. Well, Jan, just to follow up on what Sullivan was saying about the fuel, we mentioned earlier that Emerson Fittipaldi is down on boost. The saving grace could turn out to be later in the race. When you're down on boost, you're conserving fuel. So if the front runners do have fuel problems, Emerson might turn out to be in a good position. And of course, it's got to be frustrating for him now. Maybe it turned out to be a godsend late. We'll have to wait and find out. We keep an eye on Emerson Fittipaldi as well as Rick Mears there currently running in sixth place with Dyke now falling back just a little bit. One inch of boost difference. What kind of a difference can it make? Depends who you ask. You ask an engine man, he'll say not much. You ask a driver, he'll say a huge amount, particularly if he's looking for that one inch. But regularly you hear people say, inch of boost, half a second a lap at least. Remember, this is a four-mile racetrack. Ari Leyendijk with a slightly different line coming down the hill off of turn one into turn two. And Rick Mears really pitching the back end. So did Ari. Oh, Ari really got that baby sideways. Oversteering, spin those rear tires. He actually set the rear tires down off the racetrack. I think Ari might be just a tad quicker than Rick at the moment, but not quite able to get close enough to him. The Quakers stayed on board, out of the gravel pit, down through Thunder Valley again. Allen's her junior. There he is as he chases Michael Andretti, slamming down toward Canada Corner on the brakes. You can see a very good shot there that Alonso Jr. uses that neck strap. See that strap? It's under his shoulder. Comes up and hooks onto the side of his helmet. And that's normally something he and other drivers only use on oval tracks because the G-forces are so high. But the corner speeds are so high here, particularly the carousel, where they do 140 miles an hour. Alonso Jr. feels that will help support his head and his neck muscles because his muscles alone cannot do the job. Most of the right angle corners are to the right here too and that's real sudden g-loading isn't it that's right now what's the strap look what's the strap see the way it holds the helmet look the helmet pulls away and the strap holds it good neck support he gets from that strap all right lion dyke and rick mears continue at it in the battle for sixth place lion dyke right there behind mears picked up an advantage coming down on the back side of the circuit now they've got the front stretch to navigate rick mears comes through the turn 13 section just a little bit faster than lion dyke and gets off of 14 and onto the pit straight a bit better been a little bit of a struggle for Rick this weekend. Uh, remember, he was on the front row here last year, had a great job. They ran in ninth and tenth places himself and Emerson early in the race. It's a bit of a struggle, but look at Al Unser Jr. Under braking, he closes right up on Michael Andretti. But look, again, they're off the racetrack, and again, they're off the racetrack. Fight continues at the front of the field. Michael Andretti trying to hold off Al Unser Jr. Ready for her first bratwurst at one of the concession stands here at Road America. Jr. continue their fight, heading for turn one. Just ahead of them is Willie T. Ribs as they work their way through this circuit and continue their battle at the front of the field. And Allenser Jr. has been steadily closing down. Number 10, that's Willie T. Ribs. Derek, D Derek Walker and the crew, they, they really got an interesting program going on the car this weekend. Well, they really have. We'll see on that rear wing, there's a phone number there, 1-800-4-A-CHILD. That's an organization... It's really a nationwide 800 number that if you know of any child abuse cases, you can call this number. So really a nice cause being served here on the back of Willie T. Ribs car also. Another interesting name on that car is Camille Cosby. You bet. <laughs> oh, Bill got moved to the back wing. He didn't pay enough, but Camille got prime position this weekend. I guess Bill made the mistake of bringing Camille to a race, uh, most notably at the Metal Meadowlands, and she'd not been to one. And she said, wait a minute, we got to help this guy some more. Speaking of great racing here at the front of the field, Alan's her junior with Michael Andretti right there behind him now as they have swapped positions coming down the hill. Oh, Willie T doing the 
right thing. Look at that. And that's a great thing to see. The leaders are behind him. He moves offline, lets them get ahead with their bat. Look at that ball, 172 miles an hour they're doing. Willie T became a factor in the battle for the lead as Little Al gets back to the front. Michael Andretti is right there, though, and I don't think it's going to stand for that very long. Well, how many times have we seen traffic play a critical role in the outcome of a race? And again, we see it. Al Jr. takes full opportunity and gets by Michael. Just in that brief instant, Michael Andretti is pushed back into second place, and Al Unser Jr. still using every inch of this circuit he can as we look through the entire field once again. And the fight continues at the front. Michael Andretti has to be frustrated with that situation. Well, frustration. <laughs> There's another pit stop coming up. So if he's in the same position again, he's going to start to shake his fist again at his crew and say, please, please try and help me again. He has one more pit stop to try and get it, get it done. Not worse than the crew now. Go down saying, come on, Michael, we did it once for you. We have to keep winning this thing for you. The interesting thing is, Al Jr. was a good five seconds behind Michael. And in the space of, what, six or seven laps, he ran him down and made the pass. So Al Jr., who was the fastest man here on Saturday, the fastest man in qualifying, he is in very good shape. Michael Andretti once again with his work cut out for him, but in the overall scheme of things in the championship, this is certainly not where he wants to be in the race, but in the championship, he is still well ahead of Bobby Rahal, who continues to run almost alone in fifth place right now, and that will give Michael the benefit of points that he needs. Exactly, except the man that's going to win us is Alan Sir Jr., who is going to get first place points, and suddenly he throws his hat into the ring and says, I'm here, it's now a three-way fight. Way through slower traffic again down through the quieter part of the circuit as he comes past Scott Goodyear. Turn 12, Canada corner, 80 miles an hour. They use third gear up to fourth gear here in this corner here under the bridge. It's just a little dab of the brakes and they approach turn 14 at 150 miles an hour. Michael Andretti really closes down in turn 14 under braking and again they climb the hill. Must be an interesting sensation in the cockpit, because that's a pretty good hill. It is a pretty good hill, and believe me, you see nothing. All you see is sky as you come up that hill. You pick top gear right about the top of the hill, so if you have that engine driving really hard before you pick top gear, and then suddenly you see the pit boards, your pit men on the next corner. Scott Pruitt comes into the pits. Here's Gary Gerald. Paul, for the True Sports team, this has just become a three-pit stop race. This is early for the second stop. Fuel mileage has been a problem for them much of this season. They disengaged. It was a short load of fuel. They're apparently determined, I would guess, on this an early strategy to make it a three-stop race from the beginning. He was in a lap earlier than anybody else before. He's in early again, and I don't know that they took on a full load of fuel. Well, both times, Gary, they got in and out of the pits in 10 seconds, so do you think, Gary Gerald, that that's exactly what they planned here? That's what I'm going to try to find out. <laughs> All right, Steve Horn may help Gary out. As we keep an eye back at the front of the field, Michael Andretti settles back a little bit from Al Unser Jr. We can go back and take a look at the pass for the lead. This is from Al Unser Jr.'s onboard as they came down in the woods heading for five. Now he's a turn five. Now look the way he slides down. You hear that? Oh, we one little correction there. Boy, Michael left the door open and he paid for us. At the time, we were chattering away about Willie T's rear wing. And Al Unser Jr. saw the opportunity, decided not to wait, and took it. And Al Unser Jr. back in front. But Michael Andretti is still right there at Road America. Rick Mears in the pits, an unscheduled stop for a blowing tire. Gary? And boy, Paul, it has blown indeed. Right rear, major problems. They had a problem getting the lug nut tight. Pat working on the back here, and now they get the gun out. Off the jack, Mears is back on course, but great disappointment. And boy, they just really blew the right rear. Here is how it happened in a very fast section of the circuit, Derek. Let's see what happens here. He knows he cannot make four miles, so he goes straight on at turn five, down through the little tire wall chicane here. Now, that, unfortunately, would probably cost him a lap. Exactly. But he is able to work.
work through here. In fact, there's a set of guards there to make sure he gets safely back to right at turn 13, and then he can come up the hill and get into the pit area, which is exactly what he did. But the climb up the hill, the tire itself, and then the change in the pits, very costly for Rick Mears. As now he falls in line behind Danny Sullivan, and his teammate, Emerson Fittipaldi, is just behind him. So Mears rejoins the fight in ninth place. And I think it'll take a little bit of time for Rick to get those tires up to, up to working temperatures, so Emerson will probably go by Rick very shortly. At the front, it's still the number one car, Al Unser Jr., but still chasing him is Michael Andretti. Though little Al has been able to pull out some distance on Michael just a few laps ago. He was only a half a second back. Now he's a little over a full second back. Al Jr. definitely has the measure of, of Michael so far from what we've seen. He had the speed to run him down. Now that he's ahead, all you need is a couple of feet each lap. Ten laps goes by and suddenly you have a nice little cushion, nice little piece of breathing room. Of course, what that does, it helps Al Jr. the next time he makes a pit stop because he'll be in there a couple of seconds earlier. At the start of the race, we mentioned Michael Andretti's dominance on a natural terrain road course this year. Don't forget Allinger Jr.'s first career win came at Portland on natural terrain, terrain circuit back in 1984. But he has not won on a natural terrain circuit since then. Michael Andretti, too, has to be concerned about the position that he's in because as we're now just going over the halfway point in this race, Michael wants that bonus point for leading the most laps. At this point, it doesn't look like he's going to get it. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Steve Hornfall, as you know, the team manager for True Sports, we're interested in your strategy because that looked like a time pit stop, and I don't know if you took on a full load of fuel. Okay, it was, it's, uh, it's a three-stop race for us, so we're taking a bit of a gamble here. Uh, it might work out, it might not, but uh, uh, we're only putting a light load of fuel in and splitting the fuel over the three stops. How about, now you carry 40 gallons, do you get what, 25, 30 gallons on that stop? We put about 20 gallons in. So right about 10 seconds and that'll be the way the third stop is designed? Uh, correct, and we'll just have to see how it pans out at the end of the race. If there's a yellow, obviously it's going to hurt us, but if it's green, then we'll see. Interesting strategy. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Oh. Scott Pruitt, number 11, you see him there staying in the fight as he runs in fifth place, timing the pit stop. Boy, what a risk that is, because what they're really doing is calculating the amount of fuel that's going to flow gravity feed out of the tank, fuel the hose in whatever number of seconds they determine. But it's not very precise. Well, that's right. He said we think we put about 20 gallons in. So what they're doing, they're running this car on a light load and a more consistent basis rather than 40 gallons, which actually slows the car down. They think they'll be better off with just a medium load over a longer period. Interesting strategy. We haven't seen that one used. Uh, for quite some time, but just let's wait and see what happens. Remember, he said a yellow flag will hurt them, not help them. The tactic thus far working as Scott Pruitt maintains his position, but right behind him and closing is Ari Leyendijk in what will be a battle for fifth place. Back at the leader, Al Unser Jr. at the front of the field with Michael Andretti still chasing him. The Pioneer Race recap at the halfway point in this race. We've been very lucky, no full course cautions. And Al Unser Jr. at the halfway point had led 17 of the 25 laps, so that single point is still a matter in dispute. A matter in dispute, but at the way it looks now, Al Jr. is gonna put that into his back pocket because he is in good, good shape from what we can see at the moment. And take a look at the sky overhead. It's gotten a little heavier since the start of this race. On board, Al Unser Jr. Here is Ari Leyendijk as he lined up just a second ago behind Scott Pruitt. And using the slower car in front of them, Jeff Wood. And Ari Leyendijk was able to overhaul Pruitt. Looks like a horsepower advantage there. Leyendijk got a nice one in behind Pruitt. Pulls out. Pruitt, of course, didn't make it difficult for him. Stayed on the wider line, so Leyendijk picks up another position. Something to consider here at Road America. On 12 occasions, drivers have run out of fuel here at Elkhart Lake, including Michael Andretti, Al Unser Jr., and Bobby Rahal, the three key players in the points fight. Complete. The crew for Allen's or Jr. has already laid out tires extensively.
into the fuel hoses, and he's ready for what should be his second and final stop of the day. Remember how the first stops went. Allinger Jr. is in ahead of Michael, and here is Jan Bikas. Well, Paul, I wonder if it is going to be the final stop. This seems awfully early. He is leading, but he's in earlier than you'd expect him to be right now. No chassis change is expected. We'll just have to see. Could this be the last stop? So maybe there is going to be a splash and go. We'll check into that. So Alan Jr. will come back into the order in fifth place as Michael Andretti reassumes the lead. Maybe not fifth. Scott Goodyear is here trying to get around the former leader of the race. Remember, though, that Alan Jr., his tires are not up to full operating temperature just yet. We say that, Derek. What does that mean? Well, as the tires get warmer, the rubber gets more sticky, stickier. Actually grips that road better. So the hotter they are, the more grip they have. But it takes about three laps sometimes, depending on the car and the condition, to get that optimum temperature, which gives you the most grip. And, of course, grip gives you speed. And with the stop, Michael Andretti inherits the lead once again. His crew does not look like it is ready to go out on this lap, so they may be able to carry it further. Jan Bikas, what have they done with Al Unser Jr.? Well, Rick Gallus says that he doesn't think Michael can make it on just that one stop. So they said, we're going to come in early and get the best benefit out of those tires. Derek was saying how important it was to have the temperature, have the tires gripping. They think coming in a little early and then saving a splash and go for the end is a strategy they want to use, assuming Michael cannot make it with just one more stop. Oh, interesting tactics. I love it. Michael Andretti is still out as he comes through the final turn and does not make the turn in for pit road. So they're going to play in the Newman Haas team an entirely different game. Well, we see Michael in the early stops. He was one of the last people to stop, so we know he gets good fuel mileage. However, remember, not only do the Gallus Craco team monitor their team and their cars, but they're also monitoring Michael. And as you heard, they don't believe their gamble's going to work. Well, here's a split back for Michael. Good in that his name's Andretti. Bad in that only one driver has ever gone on from a win here to the championship, and that was his dad. Michael Andretti, I don't think, is much bothered by those kind of things. Every time you ask him about something like that, it doesn't seem to bother him. He just says, look, we've got to race this thing. We've got to drive as fast as we can. I, yeah, I doubt if he'd even, uh, even know what you're talking about half the time. He's a driver that doesn't care about the past. Everything is in the future. Everything is today, and be successful. Michael Andretti still using a good portion of the course. <laughs> and, a, and a good portion of the track that he shouldn't be using. A little bit of the grass. <laughs> Michael is running much lighter than Al Unser Jr., so he should be turning down faster laps at this point. 127 miles an hour is the average speed of the race. That's nearly five miles an hour faster than Danny Sullivan's record set back here two years ago. 140 miles an hour through that carousel we just saw him go through. This is the kink that we saw them, them do above 170 miles an hour earlier. Other races here at Road America this weekend. The Tide Trans Am and Scott Sharp took the win with a nice run. Very interesting race that you'll see also here on ESPN. Managed to take the win and, of course, the Drivers' Championship. Scott Pruitt pulls off the course. Now, this isn't part of the tactics as he rolls totally to a stop. And in the pits for Bobby Rahal, who runs in third place now, behind Michael and Mario Andretti. The crew is laid out. An entirely different tactic being played here, though it's still in the Gallus Greco operation. That's right, different tactic. And we see on that steering wheel, we see Rahal, a little correction there as he comes off turn 14. See, he's 37.1. That means his digital readout has got to that figure. Now he's in. IndyCar has used the chicane at the head of the pits, the only race body that does so. And Rahal heads down toward Jan Bikas. Derek Daly, you were talking about the correction he made in the cockpit. That's because he's radioed in. The car is loose. He locks the brakes, but he is able to get stopped in time. They're going to put on a new set of tires, obviously, all the way around. They think that the new rear tires may cure that looseness. Looseness meaning the back of the car is sliding. They're not going to wait for all the fuel. They're only going to wait. They do go with a front wing adjustment to try and get the aerodynamics better. And he's out of here in 14.1 seconds. Ray Hall away. To him slip through the gears as he came out of there. Good stop for Bobby Rahal. Two entirely different game plans being played here. Ari Leyendijk into the Granatelli pits. 
Dyke came in running well down in the order in fifth place and has not been in contest. But look at Ari light the tires too. Light those tires. Get as much heat in those rear tires as you can. One of the ways to do that is to get some wheel spin exiting your pits from a dead stop. But so much more than just hard acceleration. Michael Andretti continues to work the circuit. Though now the Newman Haas team for both Michael and Mario running first and second. They have laid out the equipment. And interesting on the last stop, Michael Andretti's pit is adjacent to Mario's. And Mario's team had to make sure that they cleared the way for Michael to come through the last time. Here he comes again, and Gary Gerald is there. And indeed, they've opened up, and again he comes in hot. Let's see if he has to lock the brakes. No, this time he hits the mark right there. Remember last time he stalled the engine. This time he keeps the revs up. Flips the throttle. Now they make a wing change up front, or maybe they were just checking radiator. I couldn't tell for sure. They've made a wicker change up the front. He's out of here in 16.2 seconds. And Mario Andretti comes in just behind him. Michael Andretti leads the pit as the leader of the race. So another great stop for the Newman Haas organization as Mario Andretti makes his stop. And Allinger Jr. comes down the straightaway well after Michael got away. And so Michael Andretti continued to maintain the lead of the race. The stop also being made for Mario Andretti. They had enough fuel to get them to 32 laps of the 50. Wisconsin, the Texaco Haviland 200, and Michael Andretti has the lead again with the help of the Newman Haas team. He made a brilliant pit stop, but more importantly was able to carry his stop well behind, well ahead of Al Unser Jr., much further in the race. But they say that they're playing a tactic down at the other end, John Beacon. Well, that's right. We're actually in the Scott Pruitt pit because we got an update. We heard you saying that he pulled off. We checked with Steve Horn, and in fact, it was the transmission. Gearbox is gone, so that's what ended Scott's day early. Looking again to have another strong performance. We'll look for him at now. Too bad for the True Sports team. Beautiful race car. I love after every session going back when they get the skin off the car and looking at the way they laid that thing out. They're using the transverse gearbox, which is pretty gutsy. It's also a, a system that's used on the Penske cars, but uh, every now and then it has its problems. Mike Groff driving for A.J. Foyt. Remember a year ago here when car 14 screamed off the end of the main stretch? That devastating accident for A.J.? Well, A.J. watches from the pits here today as this bright and promising young driver takes that famous number 14 around. Good stop in and out for Groff running in ninth place. Let's consider Derek Daly the pit stops. Allen for Jr. stop on lap 15 and lap 29. So we know he can go 21 laps. Michael Andretti stopped on lap 16 and on 32. Can he make it the remaining 18? I don't know, but the most interesting thing for me is during those pit stops, it looks as if the Newman Haas crew did great stops and, and uh, put Michael ahead, but the stop we saw was actually a slow stop. So I was curious as to how Al Jr. can lose the lead on both occasions. The only thing I can think of is his outlap after he gets those new tires and fuel is taking too long. Maybe he's a little bit cautious before the tire temperatures get into it, but that's the only thing I can come up with because, you know, he's had good stops. Seventh place, Emerson Fittipaldi makes a stop, Gary Gerald. The Penske crew go to work. It will be fresh rubber. We didn't know. Boy, we can see that Emerson flat-spotted one tire as they pull it off somewhere along the line. Fueling hose is still engaged, waiting to finish the fueling. Now he's down off the ground. seven seconds the stop for the Penske organization Rick Reineman and the crew on Emerson Fittipaldi's team Eddie Cheever in eighth place comes in just behind Fittipaldi and makes his stop as well so the top of the order with the stop now complete Michael Andretti then Al Unser Jr. then Mario Andretti then Bobby Rahal then Danny Sullivan then Ari Lyon Dyke in seventh place is Fittipaldi Eddie Cheever came into the pits in eighth Mike Brock was ninth and Scott Goodyear was tenth one of the interesting you can clearly see, you look at Al Jr. tries to look down the inside of Michael, but you can clearly see that people can put four tires on these cars way quicker than they can refuel the cars. So they always have to wait for the fuelers to get their end of the job done. The battle has rejoined at the front of the field as with left side rubber off on both sides, Michael Andretti and Al Unser Jr. head down the second long straightaway here and in through the woods, downhill. 
Al Jr. does have a faster car. This is where he made the pass earlier on. This is turn five. Look again. He closes right up on Michael. But Al Jr. does have a better car. Again, they climb the hill. A totally blind corner. In fact, I wonder what it feels like if you see the yellow flag come out as you start to turn well before you can see the corner. Now, traffic was a problem earlier. No, Scott Brayton knows he's being left by the leaders. Pulls away, but look at Al Jr. now. Ellinger Jr. pokes the nose as they approach the carousel down to the inside of Michael Andretti, but Michael shuts the door. Now, for the most part, single file through here, but they close on the slower car of Danny Sullivan. Michael will have to pick his way coming through the gravel pit. He moves to the left side. Danny comes over a little bit to the right. So Michael has clear sailing ahead. Now, Ellinger Jr. comes around Sullivan as well, down through Thunder Valley, through the kick. Now, this is Canada Corner. We featured this on the opening of the show. Look at Michael down the inside, closes the door totally. Michael protects the line all the way through the corner, so it's a blistering battle at the front of the field. Up through turn 13 now, and Michael Andretti gets a little bit away, but under braking, here comes Allinger Jr. once again. Uh, this is a great situation for a driver in Allinger Jr.'s position. He's running second. He knows he has the best car. He's made a couple of opportunities. He knows Michael knows that he has a better car, so Michael will be defensive. Alonso Jr. absolutely on the attack. Tremendous battle for that bonus point as little Al pokes out into clean air going into the first turn. Michael Andretti has led for 16 laps. Alonso Jr. has led for 20. So that point is still undecided. Oh, Al Jr. just got a high heartbeat there because he braked way too late, got up into the gray around the outside of turn one. And look how much he dropped. Six or seven car lengths behind Michael. Gives you an idea of how significant this run is for Ellinger Jr., though, as he's trying everything he can, and in cases, overdriving the car. He continues his chase of Michael Andretti back up the hill. Four tenths of a second separates Michael Andretti and Al Unser Jr. In third place, it's still Mario, then Bobby Rahal, then Ari Leyendijk. We'll be back. the number 20 car of Danny Sullivan, the alpha-powered machine, rolls off the corner at station five. He shut the car down. Here's what I'm wondering, Derek. We have several cars. Randy Lewis, uh, Scott Pruitt, John Andretti, all reporting transmission problems. John Jones. And now we see Danny Sullivan roll off the course. What on this course might be affecting transmissions today? One of the problems here is the rumble strips that are on the outside of the corners as you exit very fast. See them on the outside there? Yeah. Right over the rumble strips there now. You can drive over those. It doesn't actually feel too bad on the car, but it really hammers that gearbox. And was it last year we saw Sullivan retire with a gearbox problem? That can be one of the reasons. Jr. just behind him now. Al has been able to make up the distance he lost in this very section on the last lap. Now the downhill run once again. It has been little Al's opportunity to overtake. Will he have it again? This is a great fight, Paul. This is a great fight. Look the way he draws up behind him. Al Unser Jr. pulls alongside of Michael. A drag race down to the bottom of the hill. Michael has the line, though. But Michael can't hold it, and Al Unser Jr. forces his way into the lead of the race. As they climb the hill again, Michael looks for racing room to the inside as Michael comes back to challenge Allinger Jr. Al Jr. pulls down to the middle of the road to block Michael, but what a great move by Al Jr. Michael tried everything he knew to try and stop him going around. I would have said that was a Michael-type move because we saw that at Vancouver, but Al Jr. absolutely using the handling of this car to best effect. Unbelievable pass on the outside. You would have thought that the inside car would have definitely had the advantage. But Al Hunter Jr. said no to that. And the inside car when Michael Andretti is at the wheel, which is even more surprising because he doesn't give you any room at all that he doesn't have to. Well, two incredibly aggressive drivers battle for the lead. Here's this pass once again, Derek. Now, look at this. Michael stays to the inside, makes Al go around the outside. Now, remember, they're under heavy braking right about here. Now, they're still pretty even, but Al Jr., look, he just goes a little bit ahead, pokes ahead. Now, he turns in. This is the danger zone. Do they touch? No. No, they don't touch. Al Jr. just gets half a car length ahead. The deal is done. So, Al Unser Jr., 
gets ahead of Michael Andretti and flashes across the line right there being scored as the leader of the race once again. So the battle for that single bonus point for leading the most laps continues and there is a bit of a separation now first to second. What, within half a lap we see that amount of room uh, put between Al Jr. and Michael? That gives you an indication of just how much better his car is handling. They've done a good job on that car this weekend. So one of the Gallus Preco cars is in the lead of the race. An interesting tactic being played there. Remember, the best indication is that Alan Jr. may have to stop again. And here is the fight for third place as Bobby Rahal, the other Gallus Preco car, is lined up behind Mario Andretti. And now, if Bobby wants to try and do the same thing, he has another hard job on his hands because Mario is so experienced. He knows how to use that car and use the line to his best advantage. Interesting, we see Mario has his rear rain light on, and that can drain the battery. I'm surprised that the crew haven't, hasn't told him to turn that off, because it's unnecessary unless it's raining. They have two signs. In fact, we were playing with them up on Nick Fedora's starting stand. One is a sign instructing them to turn the light on, and the other is a sign for deer. We actually had deer on the race course here the other day. Tonight on ESPN Major League Baseball, Toronto at Oakland, live at 8 o'clock Eastern. Pictures now inside Bobby Rahal's car again on Derek Rick Mears to a stop at the head of the pits. Well, I can't believe this happened. This is the other side. He blew the right rear tire earlier, and now we see an exact same situation for Mears just destroys that left rear tire. Now he stopped right there with the hopes that the cart officials will be able to get him and yank him back down the pits. Gary Gerald. Paul, just a quick note. This is a different tire compound for the first time here at Road America than in years past. It used to be a harder compound. We understand they've gone to the compound that's used at Mid-Ohio, the tire that was used last week, a little bit softer. I don't know if that plays into what's happened or if it's just a freak circumstance, but we also saw evidence of one tire that we thought had blistered coming off the car of Emerson Fittipaldi on the second pit stop. Well, whatever it is, it doesn't appear to be too uh, user-friendly to the Penske organization. In the front of the field, it's still Al Unser Jr. running very well with Michael Andretti now a second and a half back. This track fact is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q is one tough motor oil. Now, here's Jan Vegas. During an IndyCar practice session, as the cars roll to a stop, the teams are adamant about immediately covering the wings. Now, why would you cover the wings? If we peel this back, let's take a look at what they're trying to hide. A trained eye can look at this wing and immediately tell how much aerodynamic downforce is on the back of the car. Now, that's given up half your setup already. In other words, an Indy car setup is comprised of suspension adjustments and aerodynamic adjustments. So if someone can look at your wings, they've already been able to tell what half your setup is because there's different configurations that the wing takes up. The standard Lola configuration is that of what they call a cascade wing. In other words, it has five elements, it fits together just like so, and that produces a lot of downforce that you'd use on a slow track. Now on a fast track, you would tend to remove these, which would give you less aerodynamic downforce and would also allow you to run faster down the straightaway. The final way that you trim a wing is by using these trim tabs. The smaller the tab, the faster you can run down the straightaway. Now the teams keep track of how fast they run on the straightaway by putting a radar gun at the end of the straightaway and keeping track of how fast people are running. But there's really no way to tell unless you can actually look at the wing and tell how much downforce the competitors are running. So we asked the top team, how can you tell what the other competitors are running if every time the car comes into the pit, they throw blankets on the wings? They said, well, it's simple. We send a photographer out to the racetrack, take pictures of all the cars, and then we analyze it after every practice session. Just goes to show the effort that they'll go through for competitive advantage in IndyCar racing. Let me tell you, when you mention the use of photography,
down there so the photographers around like Dan Boyd etc might be fully employed on a more regular basis during the races now, they mentioned uh, Gary oh, 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 oh. that they just that trim tap called the wicker bill as well as the front wing that's a pretty drastic adjustment though isn't it to adjust both ends of the car at once it really is a wicker bill or a gurney flap they have all sorts of names for them but what they've done they've realized that it has such a big effect in the older olden days or the earlier days you had to bolt those in while well, people like Penske and now Michael and ready their crew they actually slide them in and out so they can actually make a change to that rear wing or that wicker bill or gurney flat why that fuel man is still going to fill the car with fuel this is the fight for third place coming down into turn one as mario andretti still has radar ray hall glued right to the back end ray hall still with a fairly conservative race thus far out in front is still alan sir jr as he's moving closer and closer to that bonus point Michael Andretti is dropping further back. There you get a really good view of that rain light, the bright red light turned on at the back of Mario Andretti's car. Rain lights uses the battery. However, these cars do have a charging system. They do have an alternator or something to charge that battery as they're using it. So, although it would drain us uh, under some circumstances, there shouldn't be any problem today. It's not a brake light, it's a marker light. And what they are instructed to do is turn it on when the visibility drops, such as in rain, when there's a spray at the back of the car, to help be a marker beacon for where the back of the car is. Maybe Mario's decided that getting more and more overcast and a little darker here, and just turn it on a little early. Yeah, Bobby Ray, in case you have a dark visor on, here's my rain, my rain light. Make sure you can see me. Now, you would never go into a corner and as you're braking, flick that light on to kind of alert the guy behind you, would you? No, no, no. You're so busy when you go into a corner, you wouldn't have time to even try and find that switch. The crew is ready for Al Unser Jr. The leader of the race now makes his stop. Jan Bikas waits for him as Michael Andretti goes past into the lead. This is just going to be a splash and go, Paul. It's only just a little bit of fuel, and he'll be out of here. It shouldn't take long at all. Just wait for the fuel to get in. They have to wait for every last ounce. You can see everyone's just watching the clear plastic hose. Now you can see the air going through the hose. Man, they're waiting for every last drop. Not long, though. 10 seconds, Al Unser Jr. roars back into the action, but Michael Andretti picked up the lead, so now what is the game there? Will Michael be able to make it to the end of the race without stopping? The race and the game has just started because they have shown their hand in full. They know exactly what they're going to do, the Newman Hobbs team does. They do not know whether Michael can finish or not. I'm not sure even Michael knows, but remember, if Michael thinks he can stretch it, he's going to have to be conservative now, not run as hard. Al Jr. is full. He can run hard. So Michael Andretti back at the front of the field again. The bonus point still in contention. But for the moment, Michael Andretti has no one in direct contest with him with Al Unser Jr.'s stop. The question will be, of course, can he make it to the end of the race without stopping again? Gallus do not believe they can make it to the end of the race. So they're comfortable with their decision to make three stops. But is Carl Haas and the Newman Haas organization comfortable? We'll find out. The Pioneer Race recap after 40 laps. And those cars out of the race. Thus far for the bonus point, Al Unser Jr. dominates with 24 laps over Michael Andretti. But Michael's back in front. The Quakers stayed on board camera as Michael Andretti climbs the hill at the pit straight and continues his run once again in the lead. Enough to take you to America, Michael Andretti, the leader of the race, now with a 22-second margin over the second-place car of Al Unser Jr. Al Unser Jr. stopped for fuel. Apparently, Rick Gallus, little Al's owner, has determined in his mind that Michael Andretti will have to stop again. With an interval of 22 seconds, even if this pit stop only took 10 or 11 seconds, 22 is not sufficient time to climb the hill, get stopped, and re-accelerate it if you have to make the stop. So Michael Andretti, can he go to the end of the race? That is the question.
that now must be answered. And probably the only place that you're going to hear the answer is in Michael's cockpit, and he isn't talking. He isn't talking, but his crew is right opposite our booth here. They have the, the fuel hose over the shoulder of the fueler, but they'll do that anyway just to confuse people, even if they're going to stop or not. Well, if the race would end at this point with Michael Andretti running in front, he would maintain his lead in the points battle which, is, of course, is exactly the way he would like to leave this track. Let's go down to the Penske pits. Gary Carroll. Rick Mears is here, and it's an unusual day when two rear tires go away as emphatically as those went away. Is there any particular reason why in your mind? Well, I don't know. It just means it's not your day, definitely. But, uh, no, I'm not sure what it is. You know, we don't know if we've cut it or maybe on the curves or bumpers or, uh, you know, what it is yet. Until we really get the tires and get back with Goodyear and inspect them, it's hard to say. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Paul? Let's run down through the order now with Michael Andretti leading, averaging 126 miles an hour. That will be a new race record if he can keep it up. Al Unser Jr. second, then Mario Andretti. Bobby Rahal is running in fourth place. Ari Leyendijk is fifth. Emerson Fittipaldi, the lone hope for the Penske team, is sixth now. Eddie Cheever, seventh. Mike Roth in the A.J. Foyt car, up in eighth. In ninth place is Scott Goodyear. Willie T. Ribs with a great run for Derek Walker in tenth place. Scott Brayton runs 11. Hiro Matsushita is 12th. Tony Bettenhausen, 13th. Jeff Wood is in 14th. Rick Mears out of the race now being scored in 15th. And Danny Sullivan now being reported fully out of the race. His problem, they say, was electrical. So Michael Andretti now, I wanted to say in cruise mode, but I wouldn't say that because when you conserve fuel, you actually try and brake later. You try and get through the corners as fast as possible. 172 miles an hour, that is as fast as we've seen, um, I think, all through the day. Did we see 173 earlier? We might have. All right, Al Unser Jr. runs in second place by 22 seconds to this man. An update from Jan Vegas. Remember, Paul, when we said that Rick Gallant didn't think that Michael could make it? When we ran up to cover his stop, he said, yeah, yeah, he says, is Michael going to have to pit? So he knows that we keep track of all that information. He is now not sure as to whether Michael can make it or not, like all the rest of us. And, of course, it's not necessarily your job to be telling Rick Gallant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what's going on? on? I'll tell you what, the big problem would be if you told him and you told him wrong, we'd be looking for your body out in the field. Michael Andretti is still the leader over Little Al. Ray Hall still very much alive in the points fight and chasing Mario Andretti. That's third place that lies just ahead. And of course, there is traffic there to be dealt with. So Bobby Ray Hall, while he has been conservative throughout this run, certainly has an opportunity as they handle up Tony Bettenhausen to move into position and get past Mario if the opportunity presents itself. Ray Hall closes right down behind Mario at station five. continues his pursuit of Andretti. At the front of the field, Mario's son, Michael. Now, if Michael leads all the way to the finish of the race, then he will end up with the most laps led in the race and pick up that extra bonus point, which at this point in the game is fairly crucial. But we have a good battle here, Paul, because Alonser Jr. is only about five or six car lengths ahead. You see him right here going through the kink ahead of Mario and Ray Hall. Alonser Jr. also running alone. He has been able to trim a second off of Michael Andretti's lead, now down to 21 seconds. But he has a world of time to make up, unless, of course, Michael Andretti has to stop. And, of course, Mario and Ray Hall probably also have to stop. They've only made two stops. So Bobby Ray Hall runs in fourth, trying to chase down Mario. There he is, the Craco SDP car, looking for this season a third PPG championship. And he's on the pit road. And Ray Hall will make what should be his final stop of the race as he works through the chicane, past Michael Andretti's pit, and down toward Jan Vegas. Bobby Rahal comes in. Now remember, this should be quicker than Alan Sir Jr. because they have less fuel to go into the car. It should just be fuel. When you see that here in the hose, they'll drop it and actually they won't lift it. They'll just give him the way. There is the air in the hose. Didn't take any time at all. 5.7 seconds, Paul. So as Rahal roars away, the game is still being played in the Newman Haas pit. What will they do with Michael Andretti? What will they do with 
third place Mario. Perhaps Gary Carroll can tell us. Well, Paul, we only know right now what we're seeing on the board. They displayed as the last time Michael went by start finish line two, indicating two laps before he'd come in. We know that he has four gallons of fuel here. Mario has five gallons of fuel in his tank. But of course, as you know, sometimes these signs can be misleading and deceiving. But having to go 18 laps after having gone 16 in the first two stops, we think we'll see Michael. Well, 45 laps of the 50-lap scheduled distance are complete. Yes, they do do that. They'll occasionally put up a signboard that says something entirely different than what they're radioing, or vice versa, because most of the teams here monitor one another with one another's permission. They keep track of each other, and you're never really sure, is it the radio that's accurate, is the pit board that's accurate, or is there some guy just standing there holding up his finger saying, stop and watch? That's right. Now, remember, we're talking championship here. Look at that speed on the right side for Michael and Ruddy. 177 miles an hour. Remember, we're talking championship here. They will definitely go to the conservative side. It's very risky here. It's a long lap to run out of fuel. Um, I think we're going to see Michael in because that will be the conservative approach. Eddie Cheever runs in seventh place. Let's get an update on that machine. Here's Jan. Well, Paul, Eddie Cheever is running, as you say, up towards the front. He is one of the only guys that is definitely not going to have to pit again. Imagine how much further up he would be if he hadn't killed it, leaving the pits. Boy, without question, it will be a frustration that they will not easily live down. Michael and Freddie, the separation to Eddie Cheever, both of them have made two stops. Okay, but Eddie Cheever is two laps down. That means he's going to cover eight miles less than the leading group. That's why he can do it on two stops. Make a world of difference here at Road America. Four miles around this circuit, 14 turns. You would think because of its location up here in the middle of Wisconsin at Elkhart Lake that it's it's closest, uh, close to Green Bay, close to Milwaukee, but most of the people consider it to be Chicago's race course. A good number of people come up from Chicago. In fact, the Chicago region of the SECA conducts most of their events up in this area. So a tremendous crowd from Chicago up to watch the Indy cars run here. They all focus on this car, Michael Andretti, his Ford man, as he came by on the last lap, displayed a board, but there was also kind of a gesture off to the side, so you wonder if part of the game isn't being played here. The crew is all right on the wall and waiting for a stop, though they have not yet put their equipment all the way over. Michael Andretti climbs the hill again as the leader of the race, with Allinger Jr. in second place, 20 seconds back. side of the course, the leader of the race, Allinger Jr. has closed yet another second, 19 seconds back, and the Newman Haas team has put the equipment over the wall, ready for the stop. They have the fuel hose ready, and it looks to be as if they intend to fuel only, which would be the bright way to do it. Now remember, the whole race comes down to this critical pit stop here. He's 19 seconds in the lead. It'll take maybe five or six seconds to fuel the car, but remember, accelerating and decelerating is what is the time consumer for a pit stop. Michael Andretti, 19 seconds ahead of second place Al Unser Jr. as he flashed across the line. He will stop here. This the 47th lap. Three to go. He'll actually be in the 48th lap when he comes to the pit area. Michael Andretti on the backside now, 154 miles an hour as he flashes through the kink. Much slower, much slower, almost 20 miles an hour slower than we've seen him run earlier. Well, that gives you an idea that he's running very serious fuel conservation. This is time consuming. When you have to back off on your in-lap, you're losing valuable time. That's what Al Jr. and Rick Allis will be watching. So the separation will be 19 and a half seconds as Michael Andretti starts the climb up the hill. This will be the Newman Haas team's chance and the little Al's chance. Here's Gary Gerald. We watch and we wait with the crew. They've got him in sight through the chicane, comes in a little bit slower, hits it. There's only four gallons available. The hoses are intact. We watch. Oh, and he likes those tires in down pit road. And Will it be fast enough? A little under five seconds. Al Unser Jr. is climbing the hill. Here comes Michael Andretti out of the pits. That's little Al coming right up behind him. But Michael Andretti for the moment has the lead. Michael Andretti continues the lead of the race as Al Unser Jr. falls in just behind. They make the stop on the 48th lap with just two laps to go. The Newman Haas team for the moment has kept his driver out in front. And Al Unser Jr. knows he has a better race car. So he's got very short time, though, to prove the point. 
joined once again three times in this race. He has shown and proven how good his car is. He's only got two more laps to do it. Al Unser Jr. closes up behind Michael Atkins. Station five. Mario Andretti rides in third place. Bobby Rahal in fourth. But here is the fight. It's a fight for championship points. It is also a fight for this race. Both cars very light on fuel now. And as they come around, they should see the white flag indicating one more lap, but four long miles to go. And you can see, look at there, drops of water on the onboard camera, that Quaker State onboard camera getting a little moisture. So this last, and there you see the results of it. Oh, Al Jr. gets that car sideways, and look how much Michael pulls away. That little incident with Al Jr. may have given Michael the break he needs. Look at the raindrops coming now, though. Harder. Look at Michael using all of the road. Both of them running on racing slicks. You get a, a layer of moisture down on that course, and it will be like racing on ice. That one mistake by Michael, or by Al Jr., up for that critical... Um 145 mile there, I keep losing the name of the corner now, has cost Al Jr. a run at Michael. Now as they climb the hill, once again, Michael out in front. And they should see the white flag. Indeed, Michael does. He recognizes he has four miles to go. But this may be the longest four miles of his career. You saw the speed as he flashed past. Because the bonus point, the race, maybe even the championship, lies on this final lap. Shelley thinks no. Shelley thinks no. He's too far back here. They can't see what happened down at the carousel. That's what I was trying to think about earlier on. They can't see what happened over there. Oh, look at that. Again, he's uses all the road. Slower car of Hiro Matsushita just in front of both of them. And then another car. They will have to handle both of those during this lap. Matsushita comes off to the side of the course, giving an opportunity for Michael to come through, then regains the line. And the rain that we saw was really only in one section of the racetrack. It's dry through here, but just ahead is where we saw rain earlier. Just exiting this right-hand kink that we went inside Al Jr.'s car. That's where we saw the rain. In fact, look, you can see it on the back of Carl Haas's jacket. Al Unser Jr. trying to handle up the slower traffic as Michael Andretti has the lead for the moment in the final lap of this race. Whoever leads this lap will also get the bonus point, which could be absolutely critical toward the end of this season. Michael Andretti tiptoeing now, being very careful as he comes off the carousel through the gravel pit. Now we know why Michael was running just a little bit slower earlier. We see that yellow and red flag that denotes oil or moisture on the racetrack. It is raining out on this back section, but Michael Andretti is now clear and safe. Michael Andretti makes the turn down into Canada Corner. That's Paul Newman. As is he looking at another victory this year? Michael will break the record with the most victories in a season for the Indy cars if he can score his 21st career win. And it looks like he's very definitely on his way. Michael Andretti, the final corner as some rain begins to pick up over on the pit straight. He climbs the hill. Allinger Jr. is well back. And Michael Andretti and the Newman Haas Lola has taken the win here at Road America. And with it, the bonus point. Michael Andretti, the winner of the Texaco Haviland 200. That was one of the hardest fought races we have seen all year. Great picture of Mike and ta Michael taking off that tear off. But Michael Andretti did not have the fastest car in this race. However, they still managed to get the job done. A great job. Fifth Newman Haas win in 10 races here at Elkhart, Gary Gerald. Five in 10 races, an amazing record for Carl Haas, who used to race here years ago. He's on the board of directors for this track. How nervous were you in this lap, last lap when the rain started? Well, this place has been very good to me. I personally raced one inaugural race here. We've had a lot of great weekends here. We were worried about fuel, to be honest about it. That was our only real problem, if we could go the whole way without running out of fuel. Michael was behind for a long time, and we figured that uh, Junior was running the stalking horse to get him to run us out of fuel so Ray Hall could go back up in the championship. I'm not sure that was their strategy, but it's logical. I would try and do that as a team owner. 
terrific job. Great Mark. race. Thank you. All right. He's headed for victory lane, and the emotion down here. Wow. It's always fun to be with a winner, Paul. A rather emotional Carl Haas. Michael Andretti scores the win, followed by Little Al, Mario Andretti, Bobby Rahal, Ari Leyendijk, Emerson Fittipaldi, and Eddie Cheever. We'll be back to talk with the winner. And keeps his hopes alive. Today's ESPN coverage of the Texaco Haviland 200 from Road America has been brought to you by Quaker State. The Big Q is one tough motor oil. And by Bud Light. Everything else is just a light. So Michael Andretti, the winner, and he's with Gary Gerald. And indeed, it's a pair of Andrettis. Michael in the cockpit, winning his seventh. That's a record for carts in its uh, history. Mario finishes third, is right alongside Michael. How nervous did you get when it started to rain and you got that splash that was going to enable you to go the distance? Well, I was nervous, but when it did start to rain, I think that was my advantage because Al was on me. But then in the wet, I, I uh, seemed to be able to pull away a little bit. So, uh, you know, it seemed to work out to our advantage. After the disappointment of a couple of years ago when you had a fuel problem that cost you the race, you come back with telemetry this year, you managed it, everything went well. Everything was right on the numbers, you know, it was just uh, uh, one of those races that it was very, very close, you know, all the way. And uh, when I saw the rain start to come down, I knew we were okay because then you don't hurt the mileage. And Mario, this young man sets a tough, tough pace, but congratulations on a third place finish. I know there's satisfaction with that. Well, there's a lot of satisfaction. Uh, obviously, I was able to sort of uh, uh, stay ahead of uh, Bobby, who is uh, his most serious uh, contender right now. And uh, I mean, I would have gone further if I could, but could have. But uh, I was about a gallon, or two tenths in deficit myself. So you know, that was pretty much the fudge factor in a, in a few meter. And uh, I went as hard as I could because the car just worked fantastic. But it just seemed like you know, once we took a set. That was it, and uh, but I'm very happy with the race, and uh, just really happy for Michael and happy for our team. So we congratulate father and son as we go back to the booth in Paul Page. Well, Michael Andretti, seven wins in 11 races. A magnificent record. And he ran this race at 126.2 miles an hour. As we take a look at the final standings, the 126.2 is a four-mile-an-hour increase over Danny Sullivan's record set here two years ago. And I don't believe that Michael had the fastest car on the racetrack here today, but he still, with the help of his crew in the pit lane, managed to get the job done. Those type of days go your way when it's your year for the championship. So the points fight is still very, very much alive, and it remains a battle between Michael Andretti, Al Unser Jr., and Bobby Rahal as we take a look through the entire finishing field here at Road America, and there are the points. Now, there are 44 total points remaining in the season. 22 points available at each of the two races in two weeks at Nazareth, and then in October at Laguna Seca. There is little doubt that this race will go to the final run of the season at Laguna Seca, California on the Monterey Peninsula. Also, don't forget the Marlboro Challenge will be run the same weekend, and Michael Andretti will be a key factor in that event as well. But here at Road America, Michael Andretti, he did the job, but so did the team as the crew got him in and out in some spectacular stops and helped give him the win.